everyone um, our lecture today is about um, retention and relapse so we start with relapse what is really relapse it's the return following the correction of the features of the original malocclusion so for example if you have a spacing you close the spaces then the space open again we call this relapse so we need to distinguish between three terminology the first one is relapse so if you look at this case here we have the canine that was crowded so if we bring this canine down and then the canine moved back again to its original position we call this relapse now we have stability how likely is this tooth to move back so basically when i move this tooth to its this one here to its final position i want it to stay where it is we call this movement stable and then the last one is retention so basically if i don't want this tooth to move back to where we started so i align this canine and i don't want it to move back how i'm gonna hold it we call it retention we're gonna discuss relapse stability and retention in details in this lecture first we're gonna start about talking about the stability what are the factors that decide the stability of the malocclusion so first the soft tissue second the occlusal factor facial growth and last supporting structure so starting with the soft tissue now do you remember when we discuss um, etiology of malocclusion in the soft tissue, we mentioned the equilibrium theory. And to remind you, the teeth are in a state of equilibrium between the extrinsic forces and the intrinsic forces. Extrinsic forces, forces from outside the oral cavity, like habits, like orthodontic braces. Intrinsic forces are the forces generated by the tongue, the lips, and the periodontal ligament. Usually, the tongue is slightly stronger by the lips, so that the periodontal ligament will help to maintain the teeth in their position, into a balanced position. Now, if in your teeth, for example, you have the tongue, as you said, in the oral cavity that is pushing forward, and we have the lips that is pushing backward. Now, if I move these lower incisors forward by my extrinsic appliance, I will invade the space of the lower lip which will make the lips not happy. They are, they are invading their space. The lip will push back again, causing relapse. The same happens if you retract the teeth for a, for a long distance. You are invading the tongue space. And when you invade the tongue space, the tongue is not going to be happy, so he will push back again, causing relapse. So if you want to increase the stability of your treatment, try not to procline the incisors. And this is especially important for the lower incisors more than the upper incisors. Because incisors in the lower arch have the tongue, have the lips, having more contact compared to the upper teeth. So in the lower arch, as a general rule, we don't like to procline the upper and lower incisors more than 2 millimeters. However, this is more accurate for the lower arch because, again, as we said, the tongue and the lip situation. So when we do the treatment and in order not to have unstable results or to increase the stability of our treatment, we should limit the amount of proclination of the lower incisors into 2 mm. In all our cases, well, there is sometimes an exception. So what are the exceptions in which proclination of the lower incisors is stable? The first one is a class 2 division 2 cases. And why is that? If you look at the patient here, this is the blue color, this is before the treatment. If you notice that there is no contact whatsoever between the lower incisors and the lower lip before the treatment, simply because the upper incisor is completely covering the lower, this is by the definition of class 2 division 2 where the upper incisor is posterior to the single and plateau and the upper incisors are retroclined, and the upper incisor is the only one that having contact with the upper and lower lip. So if you imagine that this is the new to our neutral zone, the 2 millimeter, if you simply apply the last central incisors and then you procline and allow the central lower incisor to take their place by proclining them, you're still not invading the lower lip space. You're still not causing relapse because we are not touching the lips. We're just moving the incisors within their neutral zone without invading anyone else's space. For that reason, proclination of the lower incisors in a class 2 division 2 cases is possible and is stable. Other exception is when a patient has a lip trap. As you can see in this patient here, she has a lip trap where the lower lip is trapped behind the upper incisors. 
So the lower lip will cause pressure to the upper incisors proclining them and they will cause pressure in the lower incisors retroclining them. So the lower incisors now, they are not in their neutral position. They are pushed, their space is invaded by the lip. Once the malocclusion is corrected and the lip trap is eliminated, now there is nothing pushing the upper lower incisors so they can go to their normal position. So we can procline them into their normal position that they used to occupy before the lip trap. For that reason, proclination after lip trap is stable. Same story if we have patient with thumb sucking habit. So a patient have a thumb sucking habit, the thumb will procline the upper incisors and it will retrocline the lower incisors, resulted in increase in the overjet. Now, if a patient stopped the habit, and the low, this is not the normal position of the lower incisors, they are more forward. So patients stop the habit, then we can move the lower incisors to their original position by proclination. And this proclination will be a stable proclination because the lower incisors position at the moment is not the correct one because of the habit. Once we push them forward, this is where they should be. We said that if we procline the lower incisors, we are invading the lower lip space. What about if we retrocline the lower incisors? Are we invading the tongue space? The answer is yes. So if we correct the class 3 malocclusion, will our treatment be stable? Well, it depends on the overbite. So if you can see here, if the patient has a class 3 and you retracted the incisors until you achieve a positive overjet, if you have a positive overbite, which means they have an overlap between the upper and lower incisors, then our results will be stable because simply the upper will hold the lower, prevent the tongue from pushing them forward. So that was about the... Um, Proclination. What about the arch width changes and the arch form? If we expand the arch, we are invading the cheeks. So it's the same. As we procline the lower incisors, you are invading the lips. Where if you expand, then you are invading the cheeks. As a general rule, especially the lower arch, we tend not to expand because any expansion will tend to relapse again. However, we have this kind of diagram that is kind of helping us to... Um, can I estimate the amount, sorry, the amount of expansion that is possible and that is stable. So proclination, as we mentioned, this is the lower incisor. If you procline them, the maximum you can do is two millimeter. Intercanine width, either maintain them or expand them by one millimeter only. Because intercanine width during age, during age, they don't get bigger. They stay as they are. However, a little bit of expansion is slightly possible posteriorly, up to between 2 to 3 mm from premolar to the molar area. So, as a general rule, any movement, any expansion more than 2 to 3 mm, you are invading the soft tissue and that will relapse immediately. So, that was about the soft tissue that's surrounding the um, teeth. What about the occlusal factor? Does the occlusal factor has anything to do with the stability? Well, it depends on the case. For example, in this patient here, she has a crossbite. Now, if you correct this crossbite, as we can see, now the relapse will be for this lower upper incisors to go back to where we started. But if you have a positive overbite, as we can see here, the lower incisors will prevent the upper incisor from moving backward. And there is no need to worry about the retention and the stability of this treatment is very high. They came up some theories in the past saying that if you, for example, have a malocclusion like this and then you achieve a good result with a good maximum intercuspation, this maximum intercuspation of this good interdigitation will maintain the position of the teeth, will keep them where they are. However, this is only theoretical. There is no evidence around that. And um, a lot of cases that are treated with good intercuspation, with good interdigitation, and they still relapse. So there is a big, a huge question mark on the validity of this theory. Well, third, we can go to the facial growth. When we talk about the facial growth, we're going to talk about three things. Remodeling, class 3 malocclusion, and vertical growth. Talking about remodeling, if you see this photo for Brad Pitt, that was in his 20s. That's later in his 30s, that 40s, and maybe this is early 50s. If you can see here, right, that we know that we don't grow, we don't get taller with age, but we, our face changes during age, as you can see from here to here. We call this remodeling. 
with age, the studies that look for uh, like followed the patients for a long time, they found that the intercanine with with age it will be reduced. So if the intercanine with with age will be reduced, then the size available or the space that is available for the teeth will be smaller, so the teeth will be crowded. So although we don't grow after 18 or after 20 years of age, but remodeling happen, and this remodeling, especially in the intercanine area in the lower arch, can result in relapse. What about class 3? Why class 3 is important in relapse? Well, if you can see here, we have two patients, one in class 3 and the other one in class 2. Now let's look at the photo of the patient with a class 2. With age, the mandible will grow. And we know that the growth spurt of the maxilla is kind of closer to the growth spurt of the neural organs, according to the Scammon's curve, and they finish the growth spurt at 8. While, or like the growth spurt, sorry, is about 8 to 10. While in the mandible, the growth spurt is, or the growth follow mainly the general growth, which is the growth spurt around 11 to 13, which is after the maxilla. So if we have a more growth in a class 2 cases, that work in our case, we will be happier because that will help us to camouflage the class 2 skeletal. It's completely the opposite when we are treating patients with a class 3. If you're treating patients with a class 3 and any growth is remaining in his mandible, the management will ma for the malocclusion will be much more difficult because we're going to have relapse. For that reason, the final treatment decision and the extraction decision is usually made for a class 3 patient when the patient after the 18, after they finish their growth of the mandible. So in a class 3 cases, growth of the mandible can reduce the stability and cause relapse for the treatment. Vertical growth. We have two types of growth. We have anterior growth rotation and we have posterior growth rotation. So if you look here, we have anterior growth rotation. The mandible is going upward and forward. And this has two implications. The first one is the relapse of the deep overbite. So if you correct an overbite and then the patient has an anterior growth rotation, this bite will become deeper. And this deeper overbite, that's a relapse of the overbite. The other thing, the mandible is moving forward and upward. So if the mandible is moving forward and the patient has a normal overjet, then the lower incisor has to retrocline to compensate for the, pro for the forward growth rotation of the mandible. If the lower incisors were well aligned before the treatment, this forward growth rotation and retroclination will cause the teeth from moving from the bigger space into smaller space so the teeth will be crowded and we're going to have relapse. On the other foot here we see a posterior growth rotation which the mandible go downward and backward. And in this case, if they were treating an anterior open bite, the anterior open bite will be relapsed because the mandible is going downward and backward away from the maxilla. Then we're talking about the supporting tissue, which means the periodontal ligament. As we know, the teeth are embedded inside the bone, and this bone can have a connection between that bone and the teeth is the periodontal ligament, which is the fibers that are connecting them. Now, they did a study on dogs that was in the 1960s, in which they moved the teeth, and then they looked them under the microscope to see how long does it take for the fibers to remodel to the new position. For example, here we have the transeptal fiber that go from one tooth to another tooth. If you close the spaces, we will stretch these fibers. They will stretch back, trying to, to move the tooth to its original position. How much time does these fibers need to remodel and stop doing this? Well, let's see. Now, the alveolar bone first remodel within one month, which is good. The principal fibers of the periodontal ligament, they need three to four months minimum to remodel while the collagen fiber needs four to six months, and the one that needs most of the time is the elastic fibers, which need 232 years, almost, one, sorry, 232 days, almost one year for this ligaments to remodel, which means during this year is they are trying to get the tooth back to their original position, which means that the relapse happened. So now we studied st the, why can, how we can increase the stability, what are the stability, and uh, now we're going to study retention. Retention is the phase following active orthodontic treatment aim at stabilization of the achieved orthodontic correction. 
Now, so why why do we have what is the rationale for retention? Why are we have to use retainer at all? Why not not to use retainer and that's it? Well, first it allow time for the recently formed osteoid bone to remodel. Second, it allow as well to reorganization and the, of the gingival and the periodontal fibers. And also, it minimizes the changes that could happen due to growth. We know that during our cycle for growth, and as we showed the photo of the Brad Pitt before, about how his face changes. So basically, uh, you provide retention to prevent any changes that could happen due to growth. And the last one, to minimize, to maintain, sorry, the teeth in unstable position. So for example, we mentioned that teeth are in a state of equilibrium and that between the tongue and the lips, and I can't procline the incisors more than two millimeter without being worried about the stability. So what you can do is to, bro you can procline more, given that you're not causing any harm to the patient, and then you tell your patient you have to commit and wear your retainer. So when do we start planning our attention? From day number one, when we see the patient, that's the time we start the planning. We have to do the plan for retention before we start the orthodontic treatment. So what are the factors or slash the steps that we follow when we do uh, planning for retention? So either you can call it steps or factors. Number one, you need to get an informed consent. Before you start the treatment, you need to tell your patient what type of retainer is he expecting. The second thing is the original malocclusion and the patient's growth pattern. We mentioned that how we manage class two, how the stability of class three is worse than class two, um, how that growth in class two will help us to uh, camouflage the malocclusion and the opposite will be with the class three. Then type of treatment performed, type of the retainer, adjunctive procedure and duration of retention. We will cover all of this. Type of the treatment. We have removable, functional and fixed. Now, I don't want you to uh, kind of take these numbers for granted, these kind of general numbers, just to get your idea about how much we should give the patient the retainer for. Okay, so if a removable retainer, usually it's at least six months. If it's a functional appliance, patient has to wear the growth, the, the functional appliance during growth uh, time until it's finished to the adulthood. And in these cases, we don't have to wear the retainer full time, just night time is enough. And the last one is the fixed appliance. Definitely, it needs more 12 uh, months of retention. However, these numbers are just a rough number. At the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you an evidence that shows something different or slightly different. We go now to the type of retainers we have. The retainers is the orthodontic appliance, which is, could be fixed or removable, that is used to maintain the position of the teeth and stabilize them following orthodontic treatment. So we have two types of retainer. We have removable retainer and we have fixed retainer. We start with the removable retainer. The one that used to be very famous in the past is called holy retainer, which basically made of two Adams class on the sixes, one labial bow on the teeth and the front teeth, and then uh, called the cure acrylic joining, joining the different component. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of holy retainer? Advantages, one, it can be used as an active retainer. Active retainers mean to do a little bit of tooth movement. For example, if you have a little bit of median diastema, that is one millimeter or even less, simply we activate this labial bone and that will close the spaces. It will allow an occlusal settling. Now, what do we mean by occlusal settling? After we do orthodontic treatment and we move the teeth, usually we put them into custophosa relationship. However, the maximum interdigitation and intercuspation did not happen yet because we are holding the teeth with the arch wire. We are preventing them from over eruption to meet each other and do maximum interdigitation. Holy retainer, because there's nothing covering the six and the four, sorry, the four and the five in the upper, nothing covered the six, five, four in the lower, the teeth will tend to over erupt and do the settling or the settling to the maximum intercuspation. And it can maintain expansion. If you expand the arch and then the arch try to constrict, you need to hold the arch using something rigid. And we have the acrylic here, which will hold the cross bite correction. Now, what are disadvantages for the holy retainer? Number one, speech problem. It is as if he's wearing a removable appliance, so he can get used to it, but then you need to tell the patient about it from the beginning. The other thing is that you can see that we have a piece of wire showed and as you know, at the end of the treatment, usually patient, he just want to get rid of the braces, not to showing anything on his teeth. So that could be a proper uh, a, a problem for the patient who doesn't like the aesthetic of the holy retainer. 
And the last one, which is very common, which is the common one for all the removable retainers, the patient dependence. If the patient's wearing the retainer, they will work. If the patient is not wearing the retainer, the relapse. Now, the second type of removable retainer is called vacuum formed retainer. So, vacuum formed retainer is basically made of sheet like this one. Remember that the diameter of the sheet, or the, sorry, the thickness of the sheet should be minimum one millimeter. So, um, the the lab technician will replace this one, the, um, which is heat, by the way. So here you you place heat, and here it's a vacuum. So what's gonna happen? You place the heat, you place the study model here, and then he he's gonna now turn it um, against the aligner material, and then when it's soft, the the technician will uh, hover it, like will use the suction to bring it down. So now he's bringing the heat, so. This is the aligner sheet. It will be heated. It will be soft now. And as you can see now, it starts hanging down slightly because now it's softer. Not yet. Slightly more time. Yeah, it's slight to be softer now. He removed it. Start the suction and put it down. So when the suction happened, that will guarantee that we will not have any form of like air bubbles. Now, as you can see, once he finishes from this vacuum form, he just trim it and it's all ready. It's much easier and much taking much time less compared to the holy retainer. So what are the advantages of the vacuum form retainer? Number one, it's aesthetic. Um, you can't see anything. Number two, it's more efficient, according to the evidence, than holy retainer in the retention of rotations because it's grasping, it's holding the tooth from all the corners. It's better than holy retainer in retaining retention. It's cheaper compared to the holy, holy, holy retainer. You need wires, you need acrylic, you need technician. This one is much cheaper. Easy of fabrication. As you can see the video that I just posted, it, it's less than a minute and the retainer is ready. And I'm sure holy retainer will take much more time. And the patient will accept it. That's a huge advantage because patients like not to showing anything on their teeth. However, it's not the perfect retainer. They still have disadvantages, which is one, it can't maintain the expansion. So if you expand the maxilla and you look here to this vacuum form retainer, if the maxilla is try to go back to where we started, they will gonna cause a pressure on the corners of this acrylic, which made of plastic, so they will squeeze. So they are not good in maintaining retention. The other thing, they're not good with occlusal settling. So again, as I just remind you, when we do the occlusal settling, when finish orthodontic treatment, teeth are in the right position. They just need to over rub to ma achieve maximum intercuspation. As you can see here, all the teeth are covered with a vacuum form retainer, which for that reason, settling is a really hard way vacuum form retainer. And because it's made of acrylic, not, I mean, plastic, that's a thermoplastic material, not like the Codicure acrylic, it's not as durable as a holy retainer and the last one is that it's dependent on the patient it depends on the patient wearing it and that's take us the third type of the retainers it's called the fixed retainer so as you can see here in the photo it's a piece of wire that we bond it to the lingual surface of the teeth using composite what are the advantages well it's aesthetic patient can be anyone else can see it and also and the most important one it's not dependent on the patient It's there all the time however it's not the perfect way. We still have disadvantages of that one. Number one, oral hygiene. So if the patient does not have a very good oral hygiene, we're going to start have to see here food accumulation, then maybe caries around this one or even a periodontal uh, gum recession. So patient oral hygiene should be perfect before we place a bonded retainer. And also the possible relapse or if due to breakages of the um, retainer. The problem with the bonded retainer that Sometimes it break on one or two teeth only and the patient does not notice that and this is a problem because the, these teeth that are debonded from the bonded retainer will start to move and to go to their original position, nothing to prevent them. For that reason, patients who get the bonded retainer and the orthodontist should regularly check the bonded retainer, making sure that there is no breakages of the bonded retainer. Another problem that we might face if one of the brackets again the wire is debonded and no one noticed that So they will have a food impaction in that area that might cause caries. So these are the disadvantages of the fixed bonded retainer So when is the fixed bonded retainer is indicated? Well 
A, we don't need to see the list of seven uh, rows. We don't need to memorize these. We just need to understand them. We use bonded retainer in a cases that they have low stability. They have a high relapse potential. These are the cases in which we use um, uh, bonded retainer. So let's start with them one by one. First, severe rotation. As we remember, we have the supracrystal fibers. These fibers run from one tooth to the other. When you have rotation or spacing, what's going to happen that, that you close the space or you correct the rotation, then the fibers uh, will um, remodel trying to bring the teeth back where we started. And for that reason, bonded retainer is good. If you do lower incisor proclination at the end of the treatment, so for example, you know that we have to procline the lower incisors only by two millimeter, but you have an overjet of five and you don't want to do extraction with the upper, you need to do a little bit of more um, uh, proclination, so that will be fine, but then the rotation that happened uh, due to this one will, um, I'm sorry, but the proclination that um, happen is not going to be stable because we're invading the soft tissue environment so we need to use a bonded retainer if we're going to do a combined ortho treatment and period treatment because of the periodontal support it will be compromised and as we mentioned before usually a co-periodontal support will help the lips so will, they will stand against the cane the tongue but now with any um, kind of gum recession or attachment loss that will be uh, difficult so we use bonded retainer to maintain the teeth and we can use it as well for splinting after a period treatment to prevent the teeth from moving if we have again as i mentioned diastema or uh, generalized spacing when you try to close them you are stretching the gingival that transeptal fiber and the periodontal fiber and they are not happy with that they are trying to stretch back again severely displaced palatal canine again if you have a severely displaced canine it moved a huge amount of distance so now it any relapse happen will will go and bring the tooth back and it's really highly highly likely to have uh, this relapse that's why we need to place a bonded retainer now if you have a cross bite as we mentioned when you correct the cross bite anteriorly especially now the stability after we finish the treatment depend on the, depend on the amount of the overbite how much overlap we have between the upper and lower incisors if we don't have this positive overlap we don't have a positive overlap then relapse is inevitable we can we might have relapse it's a high probability to have a relapse for that reason bonded retainer can solve the problem teeth without opposing we know that if you have a teeth without opposing they will tend to over erupt to prevent this over eruption we simply can use bonded retainer and now we move to the adjunctive procedure that we might use to enhance stability something we can do the first one we call it the CSF, the circumferential supracrystal fibrotomy. We mentioned that elastic fibers take most of the time to remodel, almost a year. Now we have circumferential supracrystal fibers that mainly contain elastic fibers, which is needing um, one year to uh, remodel. So one way to do it when you do a rotation is to do this surgical procedure in which you cut all these fibers and you eliminate the chances of relapse. However, you need to do this quite often and you need to numb the patient. So if you're using bonded retainer anyway, so why to do the surgical procedure? So, so far we don't have any evidence that the surgical procedure is better than the holy retainer. It's just written in the literature that it increases the stability of the case. The other option is to do phrenectomy. And we do usually this one when we're trying to close a median diastema. And this median diastema is not closing or hardly to close. So you bring the two teeth together and then you uh, do phrenectomy. And also that one will enhance the stability. Because if you don't do this, the, the frenum will keep pushing the incisors away, regaining the diastema one more time. So for how long patients should be wearing the retainer? Well, so we know now the type of the retainer, we know the rationale way we have to ask the patient to wear retainer, which cases requires more retention than the other. The last thing to discuss today is the duration for how long the patient should be wearing the retainer. Well, we need to do a little bit of evidence, guys. We have, so you remember in the hierarchy of evidence, the highest hierarchy of evidence is the Cochrane Library and the Systematic Review. And we have these two papers that for Simon Littlewood, that's for the skeleton, for the Cochrane Library, and Dalia al um for the Systematic Review. So what did they found? First, that the, when they did the follow-up for the patient, 
They found that 10 years after treatment was completed, 70% of the cases needed retreatment. So after 10 years, 70 cases has a huge relapse that required retreatment, which is a lot. Following up these cases, after 20 to 30 years, they found even greater relapse. So basically, if you're going to tell your patient to wear the retainer only for one year, you're still going to have relapse because as you can see here, following the patient for 10 years and even 20 years, we still have remodeling and relapse. And here the relapse is not related to the tooth movement that we did already. It's just depending uh, uh, for the maturation and the growth that is happening for the patient. Again, how many hours the patient should be wearing the retainer? Evidence found if the patient is wearing it full time or part time, you get the same result. So basically now we are asking the patient to wear the retainer only during night time. So this is how the retainer uh, is going to look like. So we're going to have a bonded retainer in the upper and then an Essex or the vacuum formed retainer on top of that. Same in the lower. That's kind of now the rationale or the kind of strategy or the protocol we're following for retention. So once we finish all of that, we understand now retention. So how we take the braces off, we call this a bracket holder. It comes here on the stem of the bracket underneath the wing. So we call this is the wing of the bracket. This one and this one. This is the base of the bracket. This is what we call the stem of the bracket. So simply you get these kind of nails or something around the stem of the bracket and that will do the job. After you, as you can see here in the video, easy to remove the bracket this way. Now after you remove the bracket, you will have composite remaining on the tooth surface that need to be cleaned. So you need to grab your hand piece and do the cleaning of the composite. Just make sure to have a good view because you need to distinguish between the composite and the tooth structure. So this is kind of the retention protocol that we follow. Patient has to be a wanted retainer, vacuum form retainer, as we mentioned, has to be for um, a long time we can't tell the patient just one year and that's it it has to be a long time actually there is a campaign that is done by the british orthodontic society it's called retain for life it's as long as you want your teeth to be straight you have to wear your retainer so what are the instructions that you need to give to our patient you need to tell him that if you don't wear your retainer as instructed all what we did is gonna go relapse immediately gonna happen now, patients should wear the retainer at night, every night. Patients should not take it off during night. And as I said, it's better sometimes if we wear it only half time, half the time to wear it during night, so the patient will not lose it in the morning. Now, how long the patient should be wearing the retainer? As we mentioned, as long as he wants his teeth to be straight. Because we show that in the evidence that even after 20 or 30 years of treatment, even if the treatment is done in the best way, we still have relapse. And don't brush the you need to tell them not to brush the retainer with the toothpaste because it contains a abrasive material only the toothbrush that they have and also never tell the patient never to eat or drink especially hot drink with wearing the retainer and if patient is not wearing the retainer he should just place it in a safety box and uh, not to just place them on the table or something like that to avoid um, um deformation of the retainer or sometimes to lose it now, if the patient misses wearing the retainer, what he should do is try to wear it again. If it's wearing, if it's fitting properly, it's fine. If not, he has to come back for a new uh, appliance. Thank you very much for listening.